Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Patrick Ewa. I'm the founder and president of Ashesa University. I have with me this afternoon, Patrick Quayle, who is the vice president for International Network and Alliances at United Airlines. Patrick and his team arrived in Ghana two days ago as United reopened the route between Washington DC and Accra. And he's graciously agreed to spend some time with us this afternoon to talk about his work at United um, and, and what they see um, moving forward in the future uh, with Africa. So Patrick, welcome. Thank you, Patrick. To Ashesi University. And it's really great to have you here. Um, I thought I would start by asking you a little bit about your background. And if you, if you would just share with us a little bit about a story from your childhood but something that triggered your interest in aviation and the airline industry. Absolutely. How so, did you decide to, to be doing what you do today? Perfect. Well, first, Patrick, let me say thanks for having me up here. It's beautiful, uh, beautiful university, beautiful campus. I appreciate you taking that time to, to show me around. Um, and it's great to be in Ghana. So uh, I've been in the business a little while, uh, four years at United. Part of that, I was at a, a large competitor uh, to the company. But really, as a, as a child, I was always fascinated with flight and just imagining traveling places or, or being in different cities. Uh, um, and I was a swimmer, and so I spent a lot of time in the pool practicing and the flight path going into the Houston International Airport um, flew over our house. And so, uh, and it flew over the neighborhood pool that I would swim at. So every day at swim practice, I would always be looking up and I would look at the, oh, there's a 747 coming in from London Heathrow, or here's the British Airways plane or the Lufthansa plane. And I would go back and study in the old days, a book called OAG, and it was a time schedule of all the airlines. Uh -huh. And then uh, as I got older, I would lifeguard um, at the pool and I would work a 10 hour shift or a 12 hour shift. And I would think, I would watch those same planes going by and I would think in 10 hours, I could have been in London or 12 hours in, in Tokyo. And so I just, uh, always had a passion for aviation um, and the ability to, to travel and, and, and be more global. Yeah, that's it's interesting. So it was swimming and looking up at the sky. That's right. So you were watching airplanes as they were landing. So it was always on the landing side of That's right. It was always on the landing side. And I spent so much time in the pool. I spent like four hours a day in the pool. And so on the on the breaks or when you're getting a breath and you look up and you just see the planes coming in. And right. But I'd rather be up there. <laughs> yeah. So I went to school in primary school. I was at a school that was near the airport here in Accra. And we got to see the planes landing and taking off, right? Yeah. And I always used to think that the, the takeoff was so beautiful, right? Especially when the plane banks right after it takes off. I think it's still the most graceful thing that I, I get to see. Um, and I did at one point think I'd be a pilot as well. But it's interesting just watching them. They're yeah. such beautiful I, I, used to, I used to think I'd be a pilot too. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, I finally, when I was at university, I took one lesson in a little Cessna, and it was in Houston in the summer. And in, in the heat, in the heat, Houston is very hot, just like right. hotter than a cry actually in the summer. And the the heat bounces off the pavement, and it creates a lot of turbulence. And we took this little plane up. In, uh, in the summer and it was bouncing around and it was so hot and I just thought this is not for me. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what did you then do in university? So actually my degree is in political science and economics. Okay. Uh, so not at all related to aviation. Right. But it was through uh, a professor, uh, Gilbert Cuthbertson, uh, Professor Cuthbertson, who spent a lot of time in just encouraging his students to believe bigger and better. And uh, you know, he he created a, he had a fund that he would actually take students traveling. And so, you know, he took me and several students to, to England and Scotland and gave us kind of a history lesson. And we went to Guatemala and Costa Rica, and it was always this exploring. Um, and I was kind of pushing for higher education and more education. And that's created a path that would later take me to business school. Um, and later I would get a fellowship and I could study aviation and I could learn more. Um, and that, that opened, you know, the key is education and education opens doors, uh, you know, for opportunities in, in whatever field you want. And right in my field, my passion is aviation, which is, which is why right. I followed that. Right. And you've been in aviation the whole time for your whole career. That's, 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 far. that's right. I think, uh, I think I'm addicted at this point. <laughs>
Wow, that's interesting. We'll come back to that um, uh, later on in this in this conversation. But let's switch gears a little bit and talk about about United and Africa, Absolutely. right? So, United used to run routes here to to Ghana, um, to South Africa, and other places. And in 2013, stopped the flights between Washington and, and Accra. 2016, last flight to, I think it was Joburg. Oh, uh, no, it was Lagos. Lagos, okay. Um, and that was your last flight to Africa that was closed down. And and now you're back. Um, it's post-pandemic and you're reopening routes. You've just reopened a route between Washington, D.C. and Accra. You're reopening this year in Joburg, Lagos. What is driving that? And, and could you give us a window into sort of first of all, why, why the exit and how have you planned coming back and why? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I can't comment too much on the exit because I actually wasn't at United at the time. So, okay. so I was working at a, at a, at a competing airline. Uh, so I joined United in February of 2017 and there was no service to Africa. So when I walked into United Airlines on day one and up until December of 2019, we did not serve a single city in Africa. Um, but look, airlines don't cancel routes that make money. Um, and so I can okay. surmise the routes were not profitable. And I can surmise that uh, one of the biggest things was the aircraft that was on the route. Uh, the aircraft that was on the route was a wide body aircraft, but it was uh, it didn't have a lot of seats on the airplane. So the economic cost of the flight would have been very high. Um, and if the revenue that they're getting from the passengers is not high enough, it won't cover the cost. So that's my that's my best guess. Um, but when I came in in February 17, we didn't serve Africa and, you know, we're looking for opportunities. <clears throat> and so one of the key things we started uh, as a new management team at United was laying out the vision for the future and looking out at our global network um, and how can we enhance that network. And I think if you look across the North Atlantic, uh, mm -hmm. we, are, we have a fantastic route map. If you look across the Asia Pacific, we have a fantastic network and into Latin America, but Africa was a a, a blank spot on the map, so to speak. Um, and so we announced our first flight, which was uh, New York, Newark to Cape Town. And that mm -hmm. took off just before the pandemic actually. And the uh -huh. last flight was uh, literally the last flight out of Africa, out of uh, South Africa. And I remember being on the phone with the US ambassador and with the South African ambassador in the US to coordinate mm -hmm. things to get that right. last flight out. Um, and then we further looked during the pandemic and saw a changing landscape. For example, South African Airways went out of business and shut down their Washington to Accra to Johannesburg route. And that, that provided an opportunity for us. And we looked and we saw there's a large diaspora of Ghanaians living in the Washington DC metro area. And so we have the right airplane now. We have a Boeing 787-8, it's a brand new aircraft. Yeah. And we have it configured uh, appropriately with a, with a smaller business class cabin with a community economy, with a common cabin. And so that airplane has the right economics and we have the right connecting structure in Washington, D.C. So at the time that the flight is time to leave D.C. in the evening when it has all these inbound flights coming in. So if you live in D.C. or if you live in you know, 80 or 90 other cities in the United States, you can connect into Washington, D.C. very easily. Times that you come into Africa, to, to Ghana in this case, and then you leave uh, Accra in the evening, again, get in the morning, you can connect on to all these cities across the United States and Canada. Um, so it's really, you know, it's looking at what are the opportunities going forward. It's looking at not only D.C., but the surrounding area. And then it's looking at the change of competitive landscape. Um, so we'll now have, we'll have Cape Town, we have Accra, okay. we'll have Johannesburg, and then Lagos will start up later this year. Okay. Now, in Accra, you arrive in the morning and the aircraft sits on the ground all day that's and right. then leaves in, in the evening. That's right. So that's a lot of hours where the machine is not earning its keep, if you, if, if I may put it that way. Does that create challenges for you? It, it does, it does, um, and, you're, and you're exactly right. So the flights to Africa, in this case, um, Ghana or Lagos, the airplane will do exactly what you just said. On much further flights, so like South Africa, Johannesburg and Cape Town, the aircraft will touch down on the ground, it'll be on the ground for about two or three hours, and then it'll fly back. And the difference is the flight to, um, from New York to Johannesburg is 15, 16 hours. Whereas the flight here in DC is like 10 hours. And so it's it's timed. The most important thing is connections um, because we're a network carrier. We're serving right. a local market, in this case, DC, but we also want to serve all the connecting traffic. And so you're right, it would be much more efficient and cost effective to land in the morning and immediately take off in the morning. But the way the time zones work with leaving Accra and getting into the US, 
it would land at a time where we have no other flights. And so we'd be totally reliant on the DC market. Um, and so what we have done is we've done the map and the map actually works out better to have the additional revenue for all the beyond cities, all the beyond passengers that can go. Um, because in a market like this, it's about half local. So half the people are getting off the airplane in DC and the other half of the airplane is actually going beyond. I see, across, okay, okay. Beyond DC. Be beyond DC. Yeah. So um, can you tell us a little bit about what your vision is for your partnerships um, on the African continent as you're sort of re-entering? Yeah, absolutely. So look, we uh, part, of, part of my division also does alliances. So it's our global relations. Um, and one of the first partnerships we signed up was actually Africa World Airways. Uh, okay, yeah. A Ghanaian carrier here. Right. And what we want to do is we have an interline relationship with them so that passengers can travel domestically within Ghana, maybe to the north or the west or, or the east of, of the country come in and get on, take the Africa World flight, come into Accra, and then connect onto the United Airways, uh, United Airlines flight. And so that's that's the first partnership uh, we have actually with a get name carrier here. Okay, interesting. And you'll be doing that in other countries that you're operating, so in Nigeria or? Yeah, in Nigeria, I don't know about, but in, okay. in South Africa, in South we have okay. a partnership there. Um, and, and also like I said here. Okay. So I was gonna, I think you've partly answered this, but I, I you know, coming into this interview, I was, I thought it was quite curious that we've just come through, um, and we're actually still in the middle of a pandemic, a global pandemic, which has had, you know, grave ramifications for many industries, especially yours. Um, and I was wondering if you could touch a little bit on just how severe the impacts have been on the airline and aviation industry. Um, and how in the midst of all of that, you've still been planning new routes at, you know, no one would have expected that right after a pandemic or as a pandemic is starting to get under control, you, any companies would be expanding, yeah. let alone airline companies, right? Yeah, so you're, you're right. The pandemic has wreaked havoc on the, the global industry, not just not just the U.S. carriers, but the whole global industry. You've seen you've seen airlines like South African or Norwegian uh, go out of business. You've seen airlines like uh, Lufthansa or Qantas or British Airways retire their 747s, the flagship of the airplane of their of their fleet. And you've seen a lot of airlines down downsize dramatically. Um, but the most important thing is um, the airlines are crucial. And, and look, our our airline, just like many airlines had to lay off a lot of great people. And that's just a travesty of the pandemic. Um, but the goal is to rehire everyone back and the goal is to grow and to bounce back. And so in a time of crisis, I think uh, you can you can either hunker down or you can start planning for the future and use the, the crisis as a way to, to re-envision the airline and to re-envision what you want the airline to look like. And that's what we've done at United is we've started and we've been actively planning for what what can we do in the future and how can we use this pandemic to rethink our network mm -hmm. and so um historically our company has relied on a lot of business traffic a lot uh -huh. of uh, london heathrow or tokyo or hong kong or shanghai and with the pandemic and the, and the borders being closed we've seen a lot of that business traffic dry up and so we've been really focused on what we call vfr visiting friends and relatives and okay. because the vfr traffic um, the VFR traffic will continue during the pandemic um, because right. nothing, you know, I don't have to take a business trip. You don't have to take a business trip. But if, uh, as we were talking earlier, um, your daughter's in yes. school in the yeah. United States, she's going to want to come home right. and you're going to want to go visit her. And so that traffic will continue. Um, and, you know, uh, I have friends who parents are from Ghana and they wanted to come home to Ghana. They've been in the United States. And so that traffic will continue. And so when you look at what we've done, we've grown exponentially in places like Central America. So Guatemala, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Honduras. We've grown a lot in there because there's a lot of VFR traffic. We're growing into Africa because there's a lot of VFR traffic. Um, and, and into India as well for that same reason, because there's people will continue to travel because the <laughs> human to human, the interpersonal relationship is much more important. And uh, people are more committed to the personal person to person travel than they are a business trip, right? Right. And that that travel is continuing, and so in the short to medium term, I think there will be a lot less business trips, and there will be a lot less 
capacity are airplanes in these business focused cities and our and our we can take those aircraft and redeploy them to other and to other cities globally where there's more VFR traffic. Yeah. So that's very interesting. So even in a crisis, there are opportunities and you just have to be looking for them Absolutely. and paying attention, really. That's, that's exactly right. Um, so beyond the VFR traffic, um, do you see other opportunities on the African continent in the decades forward? And when you're planning um, something like this, how far into the future are you trying to look in making these decisions? Yeah, great question. So. We, I think, I think the airline, I think our airline needs to reflect the, the, the global community, um, and we want to have the biggest and the best global network. Even though we're a U.S. carrier, we want to be a global carrier in and out okay. of the United States. And the only way to do that is to serve all the continents um, and, and to have global coverage. And so that's why, again, we're proud to to have four now four flights to Africa, four different cities. And yes, I do think there's more opportunities. We have a we have a short list. That we're always looking at of um, populations both in the United States and where that in the United States, Central America, Canada, and where that traffic is going. And we're constantly evaluating, looking at the performance of the aircraft um, because performance matters, right? And so this right. aircraft, the 787, it's very, very, very efficient. It can fly these long haul missions at a, at a better cost than older aircraft could. Um, and it allows us to fly further distance. So we have great economics. And two, we have to have the traffic base. So looking where our cities are. And with hubs in Washington, D.C., New York, Chicago, Houston, Denver, San Francisco, and Los Angeles, these are some of the largest cities in the United States of America. These are large cities on business. They're also large cities in terms of ethnic diasporas. And so therefore, we have this perfect combination of ethnic travel, VFR travel, and business travel that we can that we can work to, uh, to, to serve. Okay, great. Um, are there things that you would um... Or let me say, if if you if you if you had a magic wand, right, and um, you could make a wish of African governments um, and African economic planners, what are some things that you think we need to be doing on this continent to to drive aviation and drive the airline industry on our continent? Yeah, I think a couple of things are key. Um, one is to focus on education. Okay. Um, there's a, there has to be a focus on education because the, the people who are going to be flying the aircraft, planning the aircraft, or planning the routes, people like myself, people who are doing the finances, you have to be educated and you have to understand. So there has to be a focus on higher education. That's point one. Point okay. two, there has to be a focus on infrastructure. You, you, you know, there has to be uh, development in terms of uh, the, the airports, the terminals, um, and the roads to and from. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I and I would say in third, there's got to be a focus on transparency and uh, good governments to do business with, um, in the sense where it's it's a it's a focus on bringing development in um, and really a partnership uh, in order to get that fly, those flights and get people coming into the country. Wow, that's that's a really great list, and. Um... It's, it's an interesting list. Uh, I, I read a, a World Bank paper a few years ago where they were talking about, you know, they're looking at different countries and you look at, you know, sort of the built environment and the hard assets. You look at GDP um, and then you look at these intangibles like education and so on um, and try to see what really drives economic development. and. Two of the things that you, you mentioned on here are there, right? So transparency and good governance and strong education are really important, right? And transparency and good governance includes the rule of law and all of those things. Absolutely. Um, but you also have to have infrastructure um, that enables businesses to operate. Um, and it's, it's so interesting that you zoned in on those three things. <laughs> And I didn't even read that white paper. Right, I just read this economic paper about sort of general economic development for all industries, right? So, so let's take education um, for a minute. Um, so you obviously are very well educated. You have an undergrad and an, and an MBA, and you work with a very highly educated workforce. Um, what what would you say are some of the most critical things that we ought to be paying attention to, those of us who are working in education? I would say 
push students, and I would say to the students who are listening, focus on critical thinking. It's not focusing on memorizing a passage or memorizing a formula, but it's the critical dialogue. It's the critical thinking. It's, it's the push and pull with other students and with your professors that is, I think, paramount uh, to higher learning. Okay. And I think that's the most important thing you can take away from a college class. It's not, uh, did I learn this mathematical formula or can I recite the history of a certain time period? It's critically understanding, asking questions why, digging below the surface uh, and, and pushing yourself to a higher standard and trying to have your peers hold you to a higher standard. And I think if you can develop that and embody that, that's fantastic. And same with professors, to have the personalized attention to the student um, to really focus in on what's best for them is absolutely key, in my opinion. Okay. So that is a critical thinking that enables you to recognize there's a VFR traffic there, that, that, that's, that, that you need to, you can, you can you sort of engage now, even in a pandemic. Because, because you look below the surface, Exactly, right? because if you were just looking formulaically, you would right. say, we're in the middle of a pandemic, borders are closed, um, it's, it's difficult to, to travel, right? You have to get a COVID test before you have to get a COVID test before you leave the United States, you right. get a COVID test on arrival in Ghana, you have to get another COVID test before you go back to the United States. If you look at all these things, you can come up with a lot of reasons why you should not add a new flight. And you should, you can certainly come up with a lot of reasons why you should not add a flight into a place like Ghana. Right. Um, but having the critical thinking will tell you this is a great opportunity for us. Right. Um, right. And so you can kind of flip the argument on its head. Okay, great. Um, so, um, Moving forward, what do you think are, and I'm going to open it up to questions from others uh, soon, um, but where this pandemic is going to end, right? Um, uh, but we've all been through sort of this crisis. What are the biggest challenges that you see ahead of us, even as we come out of this? I think uh, coming out of the pandemic? Or? Coming out of the pandemic. What are the biggest challenges or the biggest opportunities? Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges is going to be uh, vaccine accessibility. Um, and, you know, this is a global pandemic and we have to solve it globally. Um, and so it's, it's great that a country like the United States or a country like the United Arab Emirates or Israel, where the vaccine rates are relatively high, it's great that those countries can do it. Uh, but if we don't solve the problem globally, this is just going to ricochet back around. Right. And so I think vaccine accessibility and uh, transparency for therapeutics um, are going to be key. Okay. And we have to be able to solve that in rural Africa or in a place like Honduras or, or Guatemala in Central America or you know even the rural part of the United States of America. And so vaccine accessibility and therapeutics, I think, is going to be paramount. Uh, number two, I think people are hurting. Um, businesses are hurting. And so thinking about loans and debt and all of that could be very burdensome and overwhelming, quite candidly. And it's how our banks, NGOs, governments going to work to structure out payments uh, so that businesses aren't being forced to shut down and or if they've been shut down, so they have the ability to reopen right. um, and not be under a mountain of debt that could that could be just too much. Right. Right. Now, it's interesting that you say that, especially with governments. Right. So governments are, you know, on both of the issues that you just talked about, on the one hand, you know, we're they're focusing in on their own citizens. How how do I vaccinate my student citizens before I think about others? And you're saying that actually, if you really care about your citizens, you should care about others because otherwise you just have this boomerang that's gonna happen and affect your citizens anyway. Absolutely. But another thing that governments have done, all most governments have done is they sort of stepped in with economic stimulus plans in the midst of the pandemic so we didn't all fall into a great another great depression right um so a lot of government spending has happened all over the world <laughs> yeah in in this country our government you know gave free electricity free water um distributed food to some people all of this stuff the united states had these very big outlays um but the flip side of that is as we come out of the, out of the pandemic Governments are want to be, they're going to want to 
recoup some of that funding <laughs> by taxing more, yeah. right? Um, is this something that you're concerned about? I, mean, I, I, I am. I am. I am definitely concerned about it. I don't have the answer. Uh, I'm not smart enough to have that answer, but it, it is something I'm concerned about, right? And that's where you have to you have to restructure the debt in a way that that uh, you, you can't tax people, you know, to a point that it breaks. But obviously, we do have to repay it. The money is not right, free, right? And it has to go back. And these social programs are key. Right. I mean, like you said, uh, in the United States, there's been a lot of spending on social programs, which is key. The safety right. net is key. Right. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of smart people out there that are working on that. Uh, and so I don't I don't have the answer. So it's a fine balance that has to be struck. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yes, they do need to recoup that funding, but they need to do it in a, in a measured way. Absolutely. They need to pay attention and we don't fall back into some kind of economic stress. We have to have the social programs. We have to have the, again, the therapeutics, the medicine, the vaccines, right. the food assistance programs, the housing programs. Those are paramount. We right. have to have it. That comes at a cost. And obviously the money is just not printed off. And so right. how you how you pay that back, I, I don't know. Uh, but businesses also need to businesses need to, do need to be revived. So yeah, businesses need, need, to, to need, businesses need to be revived, number one, and businesses need to contribute to society yeah. and pay their taxes, right? right? We can't have you know businesses just offshoring uh, corporations for you know purposes of lowering right. their taxes, right? We need to right. contribute to society. We have an obligation to society. We have an obligation to help other people. Right. Um, how we structure that and how we work the intricacies, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity. Okay, great. Okay. So on that note, um, I'm going to switch uh, to some questions from our audience. And uh, um, so uh, the first question that I'm seeing is there's a strong, strong debate in Ghana about the need for a national airline. Um, and the question is, how would a national carrier affect United's operations in the country? Yeah, so I think, I don't think I don't think every country needs a national airline. I think uh, if you look globally, um, and if you look, airlines are very expensive. Let me just start with that. Airlines right. are very, very, very expensive. Um, and I think if there are nationalized carriers that aren't run in a way that is economical, so where it's just flying the flag, so to speak, where you're just right. flying to fly. So for example, if you're just flying Accra to London or Accra to New York, just to fly the flag and not focus on economics, I think that puts um, irrational kind of behavior into the marketplace. And what that does, it actually discourages airlines like a United or like a Delta um, from coming into the marketplace because it distorts the market conditions. Uh, right. So what I would say is um, I think a flag carrier is something that every country likes and aspires to uh, right. because it's nice to see your flag on the airplane flying all around the globe. Uh, but left... Um, left to just fly without kind of the economic realities of a return on investment or return on the aircraft. Um, I think it can distort the market and would actually, in this case, um, create an environment where you wouldn't have the service from other carriers right. uh, coming in. Right. And, and it's interesting, the example you gave about partnership in Ghana, you know, uh, Africa World Airlines actually flies the Ghana flag, right? Yeah, they do. Um, and and they're, but they're doing the domestic all part of uh, the connection. Correct. Um, so and so and so that's a situation where again, like Africa World and United are working together. And right. so someone can travel domestically on Africa World, fly into Accra, and then connect seamlessly onto United Airlines flight and get to the country. Right. Right. So yeah. that allows uh, a Ghanaian national to have an airline or have a choice, but yet the country is not burdened with buying these expensive aircraft. These aircrafts are not cheap. You know, right, these are, right. are multi-hundred million dollar aircraft um, right. just for one. Yeah. And so when you take the aircraft and you take the maintenance and you take the resources, it, it adds up. So I would say airlines are important economic engines and airlines are important uh, to be run properly. But again, if there's too many examples of airlines that have been started by governments that don't have a plan or don't have a roadmap. Right. And as a result, they just burn through a lot of cash and eventually, then right. that's cash that could be quite candidly going to education, going to healthcare, right. going to housing, which I think is far more important than starting an airline, quite right. candidly, right? Right. right. And so, I, infrastructure, I, yeah. infrastructure, right? To, to me, my gosh, if you have hundreds of millions of dollars, with our respect to our good friends at Boeing or Airbus, 
Don't go run out and buy one airplane. Take that money into healthcare, education, roads, jobs, housing, clean water, uh, food. Right. That's far more important in my perspective. Okay. All right. So let's take another question. Um, So there's a question here, how many airlines have tapped into different streams? Oh, it says many airlines have tapped into different streams of revenue since the pandemic start. I'm not sure what streams they're talking about, but what's United's approach? Do you see United creating any new streams of revenue moving forward? Yeah, so uh, in this case, streams of revenue is like how we, how we get revenue. And so uh, good, really good questions. <laughs> Obviously someone who follows the airline industry quite closely. Um, which is impressive. So things are always evolving. And as I said, pandemics or challenges will, will ch change you or cause you to reinvent your business. And so for us, you know, um, I, I don't know about any new or future revenue streams. For us, we've actually pared back and we've actually been more focused on the customer. And so early on in the pandemic, we were the first US carrier to eliminate change fees. Um, change fees were an important revenue stream of the old. Uh, uh, it was right. it was hundreds of millions of dollars annually in change fees, um, and so we've actually eliminated that. So we lost all that revenue because we wanted to be more customer focused and we wanted to give people the ability to change their ticket without having to pay a change fee. Um, so in the past, if you bought a ticket, I'll just make it up from Chicago to New York, um, and you paid two hundred dollars, and then you wanted to change the day that you come back, uh, it would cost you one hundred fifty dollars to change the ticket on a $200 fare, which you've already used half of, right? So right. you have a hundred dollar return, you have to pay $150, it just didn't work, right? right. And you're, our, it, puts our, it puts our team members who are at the airports or in the call centers in a, an uncomfortable position of having to defend the undefensible. And so our CEO, Scott Kirby, he eliminated change fees early on uh, in the pandemic. So we actually lost all of that. Um, but look, we have opportunities with the segmentation of the cabin. So our aircraft are, Really, there's four different types of seats you can buy. There's Polaris Business Class, which is a fully flat bed. It's a flat bed, 100% aisle access, up in the front of the aircraft. Then in the, the middle of the aircraft, there's a premium economy product, uh, which offers a wide seat with a recline, kind of like a domestic first class seat. Then in economy, there's extra, there's a regular economy seat with extra leg room. And then there's the regular economy fare. And there's even a basic economy fare, which is the same seat, but just with less bells and whistles. It has all the same seat entertainment food, but it has just less um, perks with it, so to speak. Right. And so I view it as kind of uh, bundling the airline into different segments. Um, and that allows customers to buy the segment or to buy the bundle that they're interested in. Okay. Um, okay, so with United gone out of Africa for so many years, what is the strategy to win African customers back to the airline? You know, look, I think we have to show commitment. We have to be a part of the community. Uh, that's why, you know, myself and several others flew over on this trip um, is to, you know, to state our intentions that we we want to we want to be back in Africa. We want to be a part of the community, um, and it's a part of working with folks at the airports, working with universities. Um, it's it's getting roots in the community with travel agencies, um, and so I think it's building relationships and it's being committed. The one thing that has surprised me, actually is, you know, this is my first time to Ghana. And right. like I said, when I when I arrived at United Airlines uh, four years ago, United didn't serve the African continent at all. So I didn't have the history or knowledge. I mean, I knew the United served yeah. Ghana, but yeah. they served Ghana, it, it, they didn't serve it when I arrived. Every person I have talked to about United, in the first sentence, they've said, you left us the first time. And that tells me one of two things. One, Ghanaians have a really good memory. <laughs> <laughs> And two, there's baggage because of that, right? People are right. bringing baggage to the table because people are saying, you came to Africa once, you came to Ghana once, and you left back in 2012. And what I would say is I personally didn't come to Ghana once and I personally didn't cancel the route. So give us a chance, give us a chance. Um, but look, I think it's all about relations. It's all about building partnerships within the community. It's all about making investments um, and creating a dialogue to, to two-way streets so that it can succeed. Okay. Yeah, and even I asked you that. You asked me that too, yes. <laughs> you left before, why yeah. not? <laughs> After a pandemic, no less, yes. right? Um, so next question, how could flying become more eco-friendly 
and what is feasible from an insider's perspective? Yeah, great question. So look, the environment is key. Um, you know how you talked about earlier about what are the, the challenges and I talked about vaccine accessibility, therapeutics and all that. Right. Like, what are we yeah. have to focus on? We've got to focus on the environment. This is, again, this is not a US problem. This is not an Africa problem. This is not a China problem. This is a global problem. And it's gonna require every single country to make commitments to focus on sustainability. And I was, I was just ecstatic when I walked in this beautiful campus at your university. I can see you're collecting the rain wall, water, you have the solar panels, um, and you're doing all the, the recycling and, and very green. And so what we've been focused on is we've focused on a couple different things. One, we made a commitment to reduce emissions uh, by 2050. And so we're the first airline to put a hard date on there and to be zero, not offsets, but to be zero carbon emissions by 2050. Wow. And so okay. a lot of people are out there planting trees. And here's the thing with planting trees, doing these offsets is not solving the problems. The amount of emissions that we're producing, um, you, mathematically it's impossible to, have, to plant that many trees, part one. Part two, if you actually look into a lot of these programs, and there's other airlines out there that say they do these, these offsets with tree planting, uh, there's um, coconut plantations in Indonesia, which are burning down rainforest to then plant palm trees for coconuts to get a carbon offset. Well, they're burning down rainforests in order to plant trees to get an offset. They never should have burned down the rainforest to right, begin with, right? right? And so there's 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 these games around it, right? Right. And so here's how we're doing it differently. One, we're investing, and we're investing in a lot of startups in the United States that are actually doing carbon capture, to where they're actually building these. And the Gates Foundation and others are also investing in these same transformational technology to actually suck carbon out of the air and pump it into the magma of the earth so that it never comes out again. That's part one. Part two, we're focused on sustainable aviation fuel. And so whether it's biofuel um, and algae fuel, we're doing all these type of things and we've actually run flights on sustainable aviation fuel. And you have to get it to scale. Right now, SAF, sustainable aviation fuel, is extremely expensive because it's not to scale. So we have to invest as an airline industry and as governments into this technology to take algae and other things like that to make it into a biofuel. Yeah. Part three, we have to focus on uh, electrical and battery power. And so we've actually done a deal, we United Airlines have done a deal working with a company called Archer, which is electric helicopters. And you say, why is an airline investing in electric helicopters? Well, it's not necessarily about the helicopter, but it's about the technology and it's about mm -hmm. understanding you know, what starts off with a helicopter that can carry four people and go 50 miles uh, is next going to turn into a small jet that can carry maybe 20 people and go two or 300 miles, right? Right. And so again, working on sustainability and working on the point that we're not putting out emissions, we're not putting out, you know, CO2. Right. So I'm going to ask you a bit of a hardball question about the biofuels. Go for it. Right. So um, biofuels, I mean, how do you know you won't end up with A, the same kind of unintended consequences you described around the trees, right? Yeah. So people cutting trees to plant trees, yeah. right? Yeah. Absolutely. Where, you know, the biofuels are coming from cutting vegetation to create the biofuels or B, um, farms are being used to grow biofuel so that planes are competing with humans for calories, right? Absolutely. So, how do you avoid those with biofuels? That's a, that's a really tough question, Patrick. <laughs> I, I warned you it was yeah, going to yeah, be yeah. a bit of a yeah. hardball. No, look, I think, I think this is where there has to be a focus on ethical development, right? And right. so maybe it's looking out and creating a kelp farm, right? But the thing is, you don't want to wreck the, you don't want to wreck the ocean, so you're destroying fish and, and marine life, right? So I right. agree with you, it's a fine line, but how can right. you cre maybe you know, create ponds or something where you can grow algae and then harvest the algae in order to turn that into okay. biofuel. I don't know. Um, but again, that's where there has to be this ethical development. Because you're right, people should not compete with a jet for fuel. That's just right. that's unethical. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's, it's, un, it's unacceptable, quite candidly. And you can't have that. Um, and you don't want people gaming the system, like with the tree example that right. I gave, right? Right. So I really think there's, there's just gotta be a focus on ethical development. Maybe it's taking, you know, something in the desert or it's taking, you know, some derelict you know, desert land, or maybe it's something out in the ocean where you can create platforms where you're, where you're growing algae, you're growing kelp or something like that. Um, but again, there's a lot of smart people out there in yeah. the science world and in your old world so and the, the technology world, right? right? 
um, that I think can come together and there's a lot of great minds that are focused on this. Okay, great. Um, next question. Uh, so are there any opportunities within United Airlines for African students looking to start careers in aviation? And what would be key skill areas and emerging roles that these students should look out for? Yeah, so we do have internship opportunities. Um, as far as, you know, a partnership or something, I'll, I'll give you my email afterwards and we'll okay. have, you know, interested students maybe email you or figure something out and work with me and maybe we can, we can, you know, look to set something up. Okay. Uh, so let's, let's try to figure that That'd out off, cool. offline. Yeah. Let's try to figure that offline. Um, but look, I think it's important. Um, we have a lot of different opportunities at United or any, any carrier, right? United right. is not special in that regard. I think we're special in that we are committed to a better world. We're committed to the environment. We're committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and we're committed to be a global carrier, but a lot of airlines, all airlines have jobs where you need mathematical backgrounds or engineering backgrounds if you want to go into the technical operations. So how the aircraft operates, the technical components of that. You need people who are, again, mathematical, but I would say more on the liberal arts side like me uh, to do kind of figure out where we should fly and what are the types of partnerships. You need folks who are, you know, good in math for the finance side. You need creative types in the marketing side. So. What I would say is follow your passion. If I could give advice to any student, it would be focus on critical thinking and, and you know, respectfully challenging others and opinions and ideas. And two, follow your passion. Um, don't do something because okay. your parent tells you to do it. Right. Do it because you're interested in, in doing it. And all too often, I've had many friends of mine that have gone to play a sport or gone to, to, to study a subject because their mom or their dad wanted them to do it. And every time, um, someone who was doing that same sport or doing that same subject because they were genuinely interested in it always got further along even if the other person was taller stronger um, right. or, or smarter nothing overcomes that personal passion or that fire in your stomach that wants you to drive to do it right. so i would say to any student you know focus focus on critical thinking and focus on being passionate and we'll figure out some type of partnership yeah. so do what gives you energy do what gives you energy that's right, right. Okay, so will United have an Accra to Johannesburg flight as well? So good question. No, we, we, won't, we won't actually. Okay. So we are, we're focused on nonstop flying. So, uh, you know, going uh, DC or New York to Accra and then Accra to Joburg, that just, it creates a lot of cost. Um, and also, you know, it creates, you have to put crews in Accra and then you have to have more aircraft maintenance and all that. And so our, uh, our primary focus is really nonstop flying to and from the United States of America. So okay. we, we won't have that. So the Accra to Joburg is an opportunity for someone else. That's an opportunity for somebody else. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's fair. Um, okay. So, so the next one, thank you for the great points about equitable global access to vaccines. What could corporations do to impress on governments that realizing this access is both morally and economically necessary? I think it's up for corporations to uh, make commitments, to verbally make commitments and to privately talk with elected government officials um, and help change the policy. And I can tell you, I don't want to, I don't want to share too much, but I can tell you, we are regularly in touch with uh, U.S. officials, high level officials and talking about how do we get vaccines that we have a surplus out to other governments and other communities around the world. That's great. Um, and so, and look, like right now, we're the only U.S. carrier serving India. We're the only U.S. carrier serving India, and we're playing a humanitarian role where we've shipped thousands of ventilators to India on our flights uh, mm -hmm. going in. We have shipped thousands of pounds of therapeutics into India. And so what I would say is corporations have to lean in. Corporations have to lean in. And so much like on the environmental thing, we went out, we got ahead of the U.S. government and we said, here's our environmental initiative. Here's what we're doing. We went out on diversity, equity, inclusion, and we said, we're going to start a flight, flight academy. We're going to start a flight academy. And half of the people that are hired into this flight academy are going to be people of color or women. That's, wow. that's not the U.S. government that told us to do that. Right. We, as United Airlines said, half of the people coming in are going to be people of color or women. And that's because we look at pilots around the world and we look at pilots in the United States and people of color and women are underrepresented in the cockpit. And it's not because they're less capable, it's because they haven't been given the opportunity. And so what we've done is we've partnered and we're, we ourselves are funding scholarships and we've partnered with JPMorgan Chase to create scholarships 
so that financial purposes are not the reason for someone not to become a pilot, but for someone not to be able to join the aviation industry as a flying professional. Right. That's, I mean, that's great to have that kind of goal and have it high level so everybody knows you've made that commitment yep. and you measure yourself by it. That's right. Um, and as you were saying that, it reminded me about, of, a, of, a, of a documentary I watched about Muhammad Ali. And he had come to Africa for one of his boxing matches. And he talked about how, um, and he had visited Ghana as well. And he talked about how super impressed he was. He was on an airplane and the pilot was black. Yeah, and um, and he was just amazed by that. And I remember watching that, and and wondering why is Muhammad Ali surprised that the pilot is black? Because I live in an African country, and all the pilots are black. Yeah, right. In Ghana Airways and so on. So it's it's great that you're doing that kind of thing. Yeah, I think I think um, people need to see people that look like them. Exactly. Quite candidly, you need to see people that look like you. Right. Exactly, and uh, it's good for our daughters. Also Absolutely. Yeah. To see that. Okay. Um, so, uh, what business models and strategies promise the biggest likelihood of success for airlines, as well as F and B? What is F and B? Food and beverage. Food and beverage, and travel retail stakeholders post COVID nineteen. Gosh, uh, <laughs> uh, that's that's a good one. I, I don't know. Um, look, right now, uh, what I would say, you know, more of the lower cost airlines um, that are kind of point to point seem to be doing quite well because they are not relying on business travel. If you look at the large European carriers or the large US carriers, we historically have relied on business heavy traffic, right? Right. And that business heavy traffic is going to go and they're going to stay in a nice hotel they're going to go out and they're going to spend money at a restaurant because um, the company is paying for it. Right. right. And so they're going to it's going to cycle through the economy. Um, but right now, as we were talking, business travel has gone away. Um, and when I've done personal travel in the United States, I'm not staying in a hotel. So I'm going to visit my parents or my brother or my sister and I'm staying in their house. Right. Right. Uh, or I go visit a friend and I'll stay at their house. And so, gosh, it feels like feels like the more again the more vfr family smaller kind of community travel or community associated travel seems to be right now more successful or has more of a balance or more of a recovery um equally leisure be it you know a beach resort or somewhere that's open air national parks beach resorts um that has that segment is doing far better than a large city so many more people want to go to honolulu hawaii than they want to go to, to new york right Right. And because in Hawaii, it's open air, it's a place you can take your family, you're not going to be doing work. Whereas in New York uh, or Chicago, for example, if you walk around downtown Chicago, the restaurants are closed, the hotels are, have, have boards in, in front of them, right? Because nobody's in the center of the city because no one's, go I don't go to the office, I work out of my house, right? right. So um, I, I really think it's going to take a little bit of time and I think it's going to take ingenuity from the next genera generation of leaders, future students and current students right here at the university to come up with a better business plan. Um, because look, you know, some someone who had my job previously said it was not a good idea to fly to Ghana and to fly to Lagos, right? right. And in a matter of uh, eight years, that person exited the company. I was hired into the company, and I said we should fly to Ghana, we should fly to Lagos, and let's start two new flights to jo to South Africa, Johannesburg, and Cape Town. And so, what I would say is, there's somebody sitting at home watching this interview. Are there somebody, whether they're in Ghana? or in Nigeria or in South Africa or in the United States or in Pakistan, who's thinking, and they're the next generation of leaders. And they're the next generation of someone who's gonna have a bigger, better business plan or a better, bigger, better idea than what I have or what you have. Right, great answer. Um, okay, so this is the last question. Um, will United Airlines be engaged in other ways in Ghana beyond the core mandate of airline operations? Absolutely, yeah. We are looking and we're looking at ways in which we can be committed. Uh, we have our, um, uh, what should I call it? It's more government sustainability community giving uh, organization that is looking to set up some trips uh, to come over here and work with uh, organizations, schools and orphanages within Ghana. And that'll be a bit later this year, obviously. Uh, they would have liked to have come over right now, but with yeah. all the COVID, there's just yeah. extra barriers right now. Um, but they're looking at, at setting some things up in the fall of this year. So the fall of 2021, 
Yeah. Uh, hopefully when vaccines are much more yeah. prevalent, right? Right. Um, and two, we actually brought over two pilots, two uh, pilots for United Airlines. Uh, uh, one, was from, um, one was from Sierra Leone and one was from Cameroon. Um, and one of them actually, he came to Ghana as a refugee. He lived here for several years and he came to the United States as a refugee. They both now fly for United Airlines. And they're spending uh, days this week going out and talking to primary schools and talking to students so that those students can see these young African gentlemen flying for a major U.S. carrier and going back to the conversation of seeing people that look like you doing right. what they're passionate about, they can look and they can see these young gentlemen who came over as refugee and they're now flying uh, for what is one of the largest airlines in the world. And they can see that those young men have made it and they're gonna to talk to them about math and science and really the STEM opportunities. Okay, great. Well, Patrick, thank you so much. And I think that, uh, you know, I have a lot of optimism moving forward um, for your operations here and looking forward to your continued growth here. Thank you. Um, and I'm delighted we were able to do this interview without masks on <laughs> yes. because you're fully vaccinated. I'm fully vaccinated. <laughs> and I look forward to when we can also be fully vaccinated, um, but we'll get there. That's so, right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'll give you the fist bump. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks, Patrick. Okay, it's a wrap.